at it and it feels so good. Word on the street is you liked episode one of Soccer North, so I'm bringing you more of the goods. Canadians are celebrating in Portland. The Maple Leaf was strongly represented in the NWSL final, where the Thorns captured a record third title. Never underestimate the power of the moose. And this show is about to get lit up because her smile lights up a room. Portland GM Karina LeBlanc will be stopping by the show. We have a new old CPL champion. Yeah, you'll know what I mean shortly. Midfielder Mark Anthony Kay shares some of John Herdman's motivational tactics, very Game of Thrones stuff. And we'll talk about Canada's chances in Qatar with renowned American soccer journalist Grant Wall. Now, back in September, Bev Priestman teased we'd be seeing more of the women, and hey, the head coach did not lie. Canada will be making their way to South America for two friendlies against world number nine Brazil, November 11th and 15th, and buckle up. It's always a scrappy affair when these two countries go toe-to-toe -to -toe on the pitch. We are back with another installment of what's being called Canada's favorite soccer segment. Oh, so just us. We're the only ones calling it that. Okay, gotcha. Well, if you fell behind on what Canadian players have been up to this week, have no fear. Keeping up with the Canadians is here. In Champions League action, the final group stage games were played and Stefan Eustachio's FC Porto were taking on Tejan Buchanan's and Kyle Lahren's Club Bruges. Eustachio got the start for Porto, fresh off winning midfielder of the month in the Portuguese top flight. He became the seventh Canadian all-time to score a goal in the Champions League en route to a 4-0 win for Porto. Buchanan played 77 minutes as a left wing back while forward Kyle Lahren was left on the bench in this match. Good news for all Canadians involved in this one. Club Rouge and Porto finish one and two in their group. Both teams move on to the round of 16. Bad news when it comes to Kyle Lahren. The all-time leading scorer for the Canadian men has made only nine appearances since joining his new club in Belgium this season. The other Canadian in action was Alfonso Davies. He was up against former teammate Barcelona's Robert Lewandowski and Bayern players had this message for Lewandowski before the match. Levy, we're coming. Levy, we're coming. <laughs> they went on to win by a score of 3-0, advancing to the round of 16. And after eliminating Barcelona from the tournament, Davies decided to conquer a dinosaur? Yeah, this is my Halloween costume. Whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Davies versus dinosaur. The race we all want to see. Some quick updates from Women's Champions League. Jesse Fleming and Kadisha Buchanan's Chelsea defeated KS Blasnia of Albania 8-0. Ashley Lawrence's PSG drew Real Madrid 0-0. The French powerhouse surprisingly has only one point in two Champions League matches so far. Canadian forward Chloe Lacasse scored and assisted in a 3-2 Benfica loss to Bayern Munich. And it was good news for fans of the women's national team. As centre-back Vanessa Gilles was back healthy and on the bench for Lyon in their match against Julia Grosso's Juventus. Grosso played another incredible match, dominating the midfield in their 1-1 draw with the French Giants. And people are taking notice. Canadian Soccer Hall of Famer Amy Walsh says that Grosso's stock is on the rise. What does that mean more regular minutes with the national team? Later in the week, Vanessa Gilles played 60 minutes in a league game, helping her team keep a clean sheet and a 1-0 win over Fleury. From Europe back to North American soil, LAFC keeper and Quebec native Max Cripo got the start in the Western Conference Final against Austin FC. Yeah, he had a quiet night in net, making one save and a 3-0 win, but hey, the MLS Final is set. Cripo and his LAFC will take on the Philadelphia Union this Saturday. Over to the NWSL Final with Three Canadians having a chance to win the championship in this one. Canadian skipper Christine St. Clair got the start for the Portland Thorns, while Janine Becky started on the bench but came on as a sub in the 63rd minute. They lined up against international teammate and Kansas City current captain Desiree Scott. The Thorns got off to a quick start with a fourth-minute goal from league MVP Sophia Smith. Fifth one-on-one! -on -one. Put it away! They would add to their tally in the second half on an own goal by Kansas City defender Addison Merrick. Despite a number of chances for KC, Portland held on for a 2-0 win. And the scenes post-match were incredible with Canadians GM Karina LeBlanc, coach Rian Wilkinson, Becky and Sinclair beefing up their trophy cases. 
And how about this shot of Sinclair a la Michael Jordan with the cigar post-match, immortalized forever as a Canadian Heritage Minute? It was a historic night for the GOAT as she won her third NWSL championship with the Portland Thorns and became the NWSL's all-time leader in playoff minutes with 975 and counting. Well, how exciting is this? Karina LeBlanc, Rian Wilkinson joining us here on Soccer Night. Congratulations on your championship win. What a huge victory. I just want to know how you're still feeling, Rian. Um, are the emotions still high? What was it like to be crowned champion? I, I'm <laughs> incredible. Can we use words like that? But I'm I'm so tired now, but in the best <laughs> way. You know, when you're just completely depleted. Um, but watching the players have that moment on the field and being a part of giving them that was I think really highlighted why I wanted to be a coach. It was pretty cool. And being able to do this together, obviously the history is there with the national team. Karina, having Rian as your head coach, that also had to feel special. It it did. I mean, obviously, I, I, it's one of those things where I think at the beginning of the season, we thought of what it could be, but going through that moment and giving her the hug right after, she's led this team so incredibly. And I think it's so understated the impact Rian's had as a coach, not only in the game, but for this club and the players just love her. And I think it wouldn't have been possible without her at the helm leading the team. She gets awkward when I talk about her and I love it. I'll just keep going. But yeah, I think it's been truly special. We've had some incredible moments playing for our country, but this is one of a, a new one for us in a new chapter. And it doesn't end because I know, Rian, you've got to get to player meetings here, but I do want to put up, we're going to, so Portland Thorns put up the cheeky, tweet which I absolutely love because there was an outcry Rian when you didn't get coach of the year and it was keep your coach of the year we'll take this trophy instead come on had to feel good well it's very kind I I absolutely think the three that were nominated were the right ones to be nominated um there was just a really it was a good year it was such a great year for this league and for how competitive it was and I appreciate all the love I um, I think it's very kind, but um, I will take the trophy. I think that that's a, a lot more of something I'll remember uh, forever than the the coaching one. So well well earned by Casey Stoney. She she earned that this season. Look at that, spoken like a true Canadian. But Karina, I got to ask you. Um, bye, Rian. <laughs> Karina, I have to ask you. You won with Portland as a player. That's the inaugural championship 2013. Here you are winning. As a member of the front office, what's the difference between winning as a GM and winning as a player? Uh, as a GM, you have no control. <laughs> no, you know, the thing is, is that you just leave it. You have to trust and rein in the coaching staff and the players. But, um, you know, it was pretty special in the first year just because it was the beginning of the league, the NWSL, and, and we wanted to set the tone for what the Thorns could be. And, but just being in this position, being able to you know, have a different role. It's just, it's it's truly special. I wouldn't be able to compare and say which one was more, which was better and which was worse. I'd just say they both were special for their own reasons. And I think hopefully this is what, it's it's a testament of hopefully more to come, but doing things like Reen said to the team every time, like we want to win, but we want to do it in the right way. And I think that's what the team's been able to do. Um, and hopefully we're able to build a bit more of uh, like a, a dynasty here. There's been a lot of tradition with the Thorns, but what we can do moving forward um, with female leadership, doing things that hopefully we've said to the players that they replace us and we continue that legacy with having former players because Rian was a former player here as well too. So having former players step into positions to help lead the team and the organization forward. Listen, already that's a record third title. So I would say you're on your way to <laughs> having that dynasty stamp. But here's the thing. You're an OG, right? Playing in the league in the beginning. You've seen the growth. You've seen... The TV numbers grow, the coverage of it, prime time, you've seen the attendance grow, first ever CBA, salaries going up. I mean, what has it meant to you to be a part of the growth of this league? Yeah, I mean, you saw 915,000 people tuned in for the game. I mean, that's huge. And I think it's a testament to all the players that are playing. It's a testament to the whole organization. It's a testament to the league that they want to keep moving things forward. But I think it's only at the beginning. I think the future of women's soccer is so... In, like I'm so excited by it. I'm so inspired by what it can become. But most importantly, I think this is a, a new beginning again. And I think if we keep evolving and keep it grow, growing, you talk about the CBA, you talk about, I mean, the attendance, um, ownership. I think it's just, um, it's a testament of what's been done, but more exciting what really can happen in the future. Listen, when we worked the Olympics together, I thought that was the beginning of a beautiful broadcast friendship. And then you <laughs> left me 
but it's okay because you're a champion. I my miss friend. you. I miss you, Andy. I miss CBC. Who knows? Maybe I'll be back. You know. Woohoo! Oh, no, we appreciate I love you, you guys. taking the time. Thanks for always covering our sport. I love you guys. After the Canadian men qualified for their first World Cup in 36 years, the attention quickly turned to who they would be facing in the group stage. Canada ended up in Group F with 2nd-ranked Belgium, 12th-ranked Croatia, and 22nd-ranked Morocco. Many consider Canada to be a dark horse in this group. Joining me now on Soccer North, renowned soccer journalist and author, that would be Grant Wall. Grant, come on, are we being overly optimistic here and thinking Canada can get to the round of 16? Be honest. I'm being honest, and I don't think it is overly optimistic. On paper, it's going to be hard for Canada when you look at all the talent with Croatia, with Belgium, two semifinalists from the last Men's World Cup. Obviously, Croatia got to the final. And yet, those are both sort of viewed as older teams. And Canada is not. They're a young team, a very exciting young team with real quality talent, not just Alfonso Davies, not just Jonathan David, but several players now all over Europe. Kyle Laren had a terrific qualifying campaign. And I thought Canada was the story of the planet in World Cup qualifying, the best story in what they were able to do to win the CONCACAF 14 game tournament. So I don't think Canada is going to be phased by playing these teams in the World Cup. And I think it's going to be a test of something I've always thought about the World Cup, which is that it is a young person's event. And if that actually is true, then Canada does have a chance to advance from this group. Well, and you just touched on something there, because sometimes we can get lost in our own bubble. And Canada has been so great. And I always wonder, but are we the only ones saying that? Or is the outside world saying that too? How have the Canadians been perceived throughout that whole qualifying? Well, anyone that's been paying attention, and I have, has seen how good Canada has been over 14 games during qualifying. This wasn't some fluke that they won the tournament in CONCACAF, that they played four games against the U.S. and Mexico, did not lose any of those games, and won two of them at home. So that's very impressive. Canada showed they can play different styles and get results. Uh, John Herdman, I think, is a very underrated coach. And I think we're going to have the world maybe at large starting to notice only when things happen on the field at the World Cup. And maybe Canada doesn't mind that. Maybe they'll be able to go into the tournament uh, with very little pressure on them as a result. Okay, so hold on a second, though. So Croatia, I mean, come on, they're old, right? Luka Modric, like, he's, he's running out of steam, right? Belgium, Kevin De Bruyne's getting up there, too. Hey, no Romelu Lukaku now, right? Reactivating that hamstring injury. There's that optimism again, Grant. Um, but how does Canada prepare for those two teams? How do they find a way to get some sort of result against them? You know, I think it's partly about not fearing those teams in the World Cup. I don't think... Croatia and Belgium are unbeatable. You know, I remember in the last World Cup, even though they went very far in the tournament, a team like Japan probably should have beaten Belgium in the last World Cup. It was a terrific elimination game that Belgium eventually won, but Canada, for me, is on par or slightly better than Japan. So I look at it in those terms. You know, don't be afraid of going toe-to-toe -to, -toe to these uh, these teams and these players. You know, obviously, Luka Modric is a guy, yes, uh, not a young man, but still playing extremely well. Players like uh, Rakitic, uh, fantastic. Uh, and you look at the talent on the, the Belgian team, and yes, they're going to be missing some players, but they're also going to have some phenomenal players like De Bruyne. So I want to be realistic, but I'm not writing Canada off in any way, shape, or form. I've seen them play uh, extremely well too many times to do that. Grant, we know the pomp and circumstance around the World Cup, and it's so easy to get lost in it, but we also know the other issues um, of Qatar, the nation where it's being held, and human rights issues. Now, when it comes to journalism, how important is it to have independent journalism covering an event like this in a place like that? I think it's extremely important to have independent journalists. You know, uh, at my site, grantwald.com, I am my own boss. I sent myself to Qatar earlier this year. And knowing that I was going to be covering this World Cup and focusing on the soccer during the tournament, I wanted to do some stories from my site on migrant workers, on uh, speaking to them myself. And I asked them, did 
the the laws that were passed to protect migrant workers in Qatar in 2019 are those being followed on the ground and the fact is a bunch of them told me that several of those laws are not being followed on the ground and so there has been some progress in the last decade in terms of laws that have been passed in Qatar and even human rights groups have applauded those but those human rights groups also point out that until enforcement on the ground of those laws is really taking place, you don't have full progress. It's so important what you do. Keep doing it. Looking forward to your coverage as well in the World Cup. Grant, appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me. For the past five years, Mark Anthony Kay has made a name for himself as a two-way midfielder in Major League Soccer. From LAFC to Colorado to now back playing in his hometown with Toronto FC. Mark Anthony Kay has been wearing the Maple Leafs since 2017, and last summer he scored his first goals for country when he earned a brace in the 11-0 win over the Cayman Islands. Now, I asked him about the sword John Herdman used as motivation during World Cup qualifying, and it turns out more armor was involved. I love hearing these types of things, like whatever it takes to motivate a team. Uh, you know, for the longest time, we kept hearing about the lucky loony, you know, at the Olympics yes, and everything yes. when it comes to hockey. And then we hear about this sword mm -hmm. as well that the Canadians had. And, and John also said, like, this was about dominating someone else's turf Correct. and calling it New Canada. Did he also come up with that idea? Yeah, he did. Um, well, I don't know where he gets his inspirations from. Um, obviously, Game of Thrones, any, clearly. Yeah, maybe Game of Thrones. <laughs> Game of Thrones is awesome. Um, but he has a great staff behind him, and whenever they think very hard on how they're going to present things to us. And, you know, people talk about the sword, but at first he presented a shield, you know, in terms of protecting our country. Canadians have always been so prideful and and the way we play is there was always that uh, rigorous defense right so that was our shield then he brought in the helmet and the helmet was to tell us that there's a lot of external distractions going on people are going to say certain things but if we once we put on this helmet with our team like we're focused on the goal of getting to the World Cup we're for, focused on qualifying first the first team to qualify um, and finish obviously first in the in the in the octagon and then he brought in the sword and the sword was like we're gonna do all these other things but go into other people's countries home turfs advantages and all those things and show them that we can dominate and that we can be on the attack and we can be the protagonist so um, they plan everything out man it's it's really amazing like someone should do a story to cover how much work they've put in to, to present these things to us. But yeah, the sword is, uh, it's amazing. And it's on the back of our, our black jersey. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice feeling. What do they say? It's 10% skill, it's 90% mental, mental, right? Yes, so yes. he's definitely mastered that oh, for yes, you. Oh yes, 100%, 100%. I love the attacking mentality too, because that's truly the identity. Mm -hmm. um, you're not afraid to push forward, even taking on opposition that right. they themselves are very strong on the counter. It doesn't matter. You guys have that high press, you'll go after them. What is it that you're hoping to accomplish on the biggest stage? Yeah, what I'm hoping to accomplish on the biggest stage with the team is obviously to play our type of football against the best teams in the world. Um, we want to go into the World Cup and really show um, the world that Canada is a footballing country and we're not scared to play good football. We have quality on the field. We have dynamic attacking players who can create lots of opportunities, but we're also a very tight-knit group that will make it very difficult for any team to score against us. So we really have the whole package and we just want to go in there and do our best. And we really believe that we can turn a lot of heads in this World Cup. Um, and for ourselves, we, we, we don't want to, you know, just participate. We want to go in there and really try to win. Great being able to sit down with Mark Anthony Kay. If you want to catch the full interview, be sure to go to the CBC Sports YouTube channel. And I'm about to sit down with another great Yes, he's covered multiple World Cups. He's an author. He knows the game inside out. He's going to be our eyes and ears on the ground in Qatar. That is my man, Chris Jones. Welcome to Soccer North. Thank you, Andy. This is really exciting having you here. And I want to play a little game with you. I'm going to play okay. a little show host here, okay? okay? So we're going to test out a new segment that's called Something, Nothing, or Everything. So I'm going to actually prompt you with a question. And you're going to tell me the level of importance you think it has. Okay. Okay, you ready for this one? Yeah. <clears throat> First up, Kyle Laren. As of the taping of this interview, he's only made nine appearances for Club Bruges. Eight have been off the bench. Is that something, nothing, or everything? Kyle Laren, you know, he's playing, but he's not starting. 
And it's what that does to you physically, like he's not gonna be peak match fit like some of the other guys. But more important is what that does to you mentally. I don't imagine his confidence is sky high at the moment. Now, luckily he's got a lot of success, a lot of history that he can sort of bank and say, no, I can do this, I'm a good player. Um, you know, Stuart Smalley looking in the mirror, uh, telling himself that he's, <laughs> he's ready to go. But ideally, he'd be running full cylinders and he's not. So it's mm -hmm. not a disaster. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the end of the world. It's not ideal. It's yeah. a little bit of something. I agree on the something because if you're looking at that friendly against Qatar, hadn't played a lot, came in, scored a goal, 25 for country. Not too shabby for a guy not getting a lot of play in time. 100%. Uh, still no deal between uh, Canada Soccer and the Players Association. They did settle, though, on Davies, his image and his likeness. That was an individual deal, though. Something, nothing, or everything? This whole subject makes me nuts. Mm. It makes me nuts. It makes me nuts. <laughs> the fact that we're talking about this. Like, less than three weeks from a World Cup. Canada's first World Cup in 36 years for the men. Canada Soccer just has dropped the ball. Like, they started negotiating this... The players boycotted that Panama game in June. It's now November, and still no deal. So I want to say it's nothing. I want to say that they'll just push it past and either settle before the World Cup or the players will table it until after the World Cup. It could be everything if the players decide to use this moment of power to really hold Canada soccer's feet to the fire. I don't think the Canadian players will do that. I think it means too much for them to be there. I'm going to say it's something. Not unprecedented, so I feel no. like I feel like it's nothing heading into the World Cup because I, I I think the Canadians are playing. I think it's everything after the World Cup because we know 2026 they're part of the host nations and yeah. it'll mean everything. It needs to get done or this next year I think could be really troublesome. Speaking of Davies, Davies and David are in fine form on their teams. Is that something? Nothing or everything? Everything. It's everything. Mm. It's everything. This is a much happier conversation. Yeah. It's a much happier <laughs> I conversation. I wanted to get the other stuff done yeah, first. Yeah, <laughs> get it done. As a Canadian soccer fan, it's awesome. Like, John Herdman did an interesting uh, study of teams that make it out of the group stage of the World Cup. And on average, they have six starter starters who are in the top five leagues in Europe. Canada only has two. It's Davies and David. But the fact that they are firing on all cylinders is huge. And, and now we get into what I think is an interesting conversation about what is success for this team. Qualifying is success mm. at some level, right? Only the second team to do it for the men. Now is success scoring a goal, which we didn't do in 86? Is it getting a point? Is it winning a game? Is it getting out of the group? But no matter how you answer that question about what success is for this team, none of the possibilities happen if Davies and David don't score a goal. They're the guys. Mm -hmm. You need them to score. And so it's almost the opposite of the Kyle Aaron situation, where he's, you know, you're like a little worried about his state coming in. The two biggest horses are hitting the ground running, and I think that's huge for Canada. I love it. Something, nothing, or everything. I really enjoyed this segment, okay. and I know I'm going to enjoy your contributions on cbcsports.ca. That's Chris Jones. Thanks very much for having me. Who was the nicest Canadian you played against then? Ooh, the nicest. Desiree Scott. Yeah. I played with her for years in Kansas City, and she will always be one of my favorite people. She's just like, vibes, just great vibes. D. Scott loves love. She really does. That's mm -hmm. a great way of saying it. No, she is, uh, she's a beauty. Unfortunately, the vibes were not great for Desiree Scott for Saturday's final, but shout out to Scott as she was given the inaugural Ally Award, a leadership award voted on by her peers. And you know where the vibes are always immaculate? Mm-hmm. With Anastasia Busis on Player's Own Voice podcast. Be sure to check out the full interview with Portland Thorns legend and newly minted NWSL champ Becky Sauerbrunn on cbc.ca or wherever you get your podcasts. There's another Canadian looking to win some hardware this weekend. LAFC's keeper Max Cripo will be looking to backstop his team to a victory over the Philadelphia Union. You can watch that one this Saturday. Kickoff goes at 4 p.m. ET. And a big shout out to Forge FC. 
The Hamilton side beat Atletico Ottawa in the Canadian Premier League final 2-0. Safe to say Forge is a dynasty. The only domestic league in Canada has been around for four seasons, and the Hammers have been in every final. And this year, they secured their third North Star Shield. And another big shout-out to today's great guests. Soccer fever is on the rise here on Soccer North. We'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this content, don't miss anything that we're putting out on Soccer North. Be sure to download the CBC Gem app, head to the App Store, and hey, it's free.